Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back again. Welcome to another exciting episode of Carving the Divine TV. My name is Yujiro Seki. I'm a director, writer, and the producer of the documentary Carving the Divine. Carving the Divine is about the Buddhist sculptors of Japan, and I'm ready to present it for the first time in the world. But before I do so, I thought it would be a great idea to introduce basic concepts of Buddhism and the history of Buddhism. So that when you guys finally watch my documentary, you guys can watch it at the maximum value. So with that being said, I would love to introduce our scholar. He is generous enough to come back to talk to us again, and he will be sharing uh, important information and knowledge. So thank you so much for coming, Frederick, Mr. Frederick Hewitt. Welcome. Thank you so much, Yuji, and hello, everybody. I'm very honored to be back tonight. Awesome. I love your energy. You have really high energy. I hope you can maintain your energy after I ask you loaded question. So uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about the Edo period. Uh, Edo period is uh, 250 years of a peace. And uh, during that time, a uh, lot of things happen, of course. So we're going to discuss about that. So please, Frederick, tell us about the Edo period and the Buddhism during that time. Please. Yes, I'd be happy to. So uh, uh, just a background on the history during this period, Edo. Uh, it's about the 1600s to 1867. And this is, um, as you mentioned, a period of unparalleled peace in Japan. Uh, before that, um, throughout the Kamakura period of the, of the 13th, 14th centuries, you had a lot of infighting, a lot of um, daimyo and a lot of shogun, that everyone vying for ultimate power over Japan. Um, finally, you have um, Tokugawa Ie, uh, Ieyasu, who successfully unified the country. And he imposed very, very strict uh, rules over society in order to maintain the peace. So you have the stratified society of uh, warriors, farmers, um, artisans, and merchants. And there were very strict rules over what people could wear, how they behave, um, and over even the religious lives of people. So um, uh, during the 1500s, you have the Portuguese and other Europeans coming to Japan. Um, they're, um, they're spreading the teachings of Christianity and um, Tokugawa saw that as a threat to his power. And they, um, they imposed tests such as stepping over the Virgin, pictures of the Virgin Mary, basically um, sifting out um, Christian loyalists and trying to uh, get rid of foreign influences. Uh, Japan, for that entire 250-year period, they were isolated from the West and from China. Uh, they, they basically tried to uh, maintain order within Japan. So within that context, uh, you have a lot of um, prescriptions over how society should behave. And it worked well for maintaining peace, um, but it also stifled the growth of Buddhism. Because as you know, um, you have Nanto Rokushu, you have, um, the, you have Heian and the uh, Kamakura periods where you have scholars traveling to China and bringing back fresh knowledge of, um, of esoteric Buddhism, of Zen, of um, Tentai. Um, so you don't, you don't, during this period, you don't really have much of an introduction of brand new schools of Buddhism. Um, you have indigenous scholars trying to explore existing um, thoughts on Buddhism and also especially thoughts on Shintoism, which is the original um, religion of Japan. Um, uh, you, you have um, Motori Norinaga, you have um, what they call uh, Kokugaku or national studies. So people expounding teachings on the origins of the Japanese spirit and um, on the Shinto Kami, which are the, the gods of Japan. And they have uh, works such as um, Nihon Shoki and Kojiki that they, they draw references to old mythologies. And curiously enough, um, 
uh, as you know, Yuji, uh, Japan, they, they, they mix a lot of influences. So they have, yeah, of course, ancient society, they mix Chinese culture and in modern Japan, they mix a lot of uh, Western culture uh, to make even better outcomes. Uh, during this time period of self-isolation in Edo, you have um, what they call Shinbutsu Shugo, or the co combination of Shinto deities with the traditional Buddhist deities. Um, and as you probably know, um, according to Japanese mythology, you have the founding of the, of, of the nation um, with Amaterasu, um, the sun goddess and other deities. They, uh, they actually found ways to um, blend these uh, traditional Shinto mythology with existing Buddhist uh, doctrines. So uh, they actually make these um, kami into Buddhist saints that basically they're looking for enlightenment. Um, and so they, they, they create hybrid temples throughout the country to, um, to kind of um, seek protection and blessings from both influences. And they, they call this uh, bonji suishaku. So, uh, they, they combine Buddhism and Shintoism, um, and Japan is kind of left in this state for a long period of time. But, of course, um, you do have um, scholars that try to stay true to Buddhism, so especially in Zen, uh, you have greatly esteemed scholars such as um, Ryokan and Hakuin Soho and uh, also um, Jiun Sonja. So these people, they try to keep Buddhist traditions, they, they studied Sanskrit, the, the language, and they, they try to reinterpret it for their times. But uh, uh, yeah, during the Edo period, um, overall, the middle class society thrived, and um, the, the popular scholarship describes it as a period of degeneracy for um, Buddhism. But um, you have a mixture of Shintoism, and you have um, interpretations of the existing schools of thought. So that's how you can look at the um, Edo period in Buddhism. Wow, I can't believe how you describe it. I don't think I can ask you any more follow-up questions. So thank you so much. So if you guys think this information is useful, make sure to subscribe my YouTube channel, follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and like me on my Facebook because that's how we do it in the 21st century. That's right, Yuji. Awesome, awesome. That was a, a beautiful overview. So thank you so much, Frederick. Uh, thank you for having me today.